Welcome to the Datsun and Nissan Z car story, and yes, I'm going to be saying Z a lot in this video. If you're used to hearing Z, then please bear with me as we go on a more than 50 year journey over the life of this wonderful car. The Z cars didn't single-handedly kickstart the boom in Japanese import cars. That came from the solid reliability and good value of regular passenger cars from Japan's big three and the biggest shot in the arm would come from the 1973 oil crisis and the rush to fuel economical cars. But the Z car certainly helped, creating a halo car that showed that cheap and cheerful cars from a far off land can be exciting as well. Over the years the car has grown and shrunk again, but it's always stayed true to its roots. This is the Nissan Z car story. Nissan started looking at sports cars in 1952 with the DC3. That didn't go so well, selling only 50. It was followed in 1959 by the S211 based on the Datsun 211. That was even less successful, selling only 20 cars. It was followed by the SPL212 and 213 that sold less than 500. It seems Nissan had about as many tries in making a successful car as the King of Swamp Castle did building his castle. But eventually Nissan sports cars started selling modestly well. The first to do so was the 310, or Datsun 1500 as it was known in North America, again based on the 310 Bluebird. It was also known as the Fair Lady, a name chosen because the Nissan president saw My Fair Lady on Broadway in 1958 and thought the name evoked elegance and beauty. Nissan was exporting its cars around the world, but only in small amounts. When they arrived in established car markets such as Europe, the USA and Australia, they didn't meet with much success. They were slow and frequently seen as sweat boxes, with engine heat and bad ventilation systems making driving uncomfortable. Enter Yutaka Katayama. He was a true autophile, having grown up around his dad's classic cars, and when he was old enough to drive, getting his own. So when it was time to get a job, he naturally sought one at Nissan, one of Japan's small but growing car companies. Yet Katayama was a square peg in a round hole. He didn't agree with Nissan's labour union practices, which got him into trouble on numerous occasions. He read of a gruelling 10,000 mile motor race in Australia in 1958, and presented the idea of Nissan running one of its pedestrian but reliable cars there. Maybe Nissan could be the tortoise in the tortoise and hare fable. But he ran into resistance. Nissan, like many Japanese companies at the time, were afraid of failure and the shame that that would bring to their brand. They only agreed if Katayama would race the cars under the Datsun brand to shield the parent company. But they needn't have worried. Nissan's reliable cars meant the Datsun 100 won its class and finished 25th overall. This helped Nissan start to think about exporting more widely, and maybe looking at more sporty cars. Not knowing what to do with the troublesome Katayama, Nissan packed him off to the USA to help sell cars there. Katayama threw himself into the job and embraced American culture. But in the process, he learned about how Americans thought, and more importantly, what they wanted in a car. Although Nissan had a presence on both coasts, he decided to focus his attention on the west coast. He managed to convince a few used car dealerships and service stations to start up as Datsun dealers. This was no mean feat, as Japan's reputation at the time was of making cheap, unreliable things. Again, Nissan was worried of failure, so the Datsun name would be used outside of Japan. Katayama won the favour of the dealers as he listened to them and worked hard to get them what they wanted. However, as he still wasn't flavour of the month in Japan, often his suggestions fell flat at Nissan's headquarters. He lobbied for larger engines and larger cars, but Nissan was reluctant to make cars bigger as they would fall foul of Japan's tax laws. But his tenacity was growing Nissan's sales, and by 1965 he was made president of Nissan USA. In his new role, he went back to Japan to meet with Nissan bigwigs over the next generation of car, with the hope that it might focus a little more on North American customers. With little to no marketing budget, Katayama had been promoting Nissan through motor racing. 
By now, Nissan's open-top sports cars had some serious power behind them. The Datsun 1500 had become the 1600 and then the 2000 with some serious grunt, up to 121 horsepower through a 5-speed gearbox. But while in Japan, Katayama lobbied for a larger engine in the 510, plus a new car, a coupe with a bit of power to compete against cars like the MGB GT. As it happens, Nissan had been working on a car similar to what Katayama wanted, headed up by designer Yoshihiko Matsuo. This project hadn't been funded by Nissan yet, but Katayama found an ally in Kechi Matsumura, a recently arrived Nissan executive. The upcoming 510 would have its bigger engine that US dealers wanted, and Katayama would have his coupe. All he had to do now was sell them in large enough quantities or his head would be on the chopping block. Although Katayama wasn't popular in Japan, the 510's success with the larger engine provided credence that his new coupe might sell well, and so the project continued. And that new car had better sell well, because it had grown from its original design to better accommodate Americans, but that meant it would fall into Japan's higher tax bracket. Nissan was now essentially building a car to export, and for a company that was cautious about failure outside of Japan, this was a high-stakes venture. But they weren't producing cars in a bubble. Rivals Honda and Toyota were also exporting and starting to get some success and recognition. Honda had even gone racing in Formula One, winning the 1965 Mexican Grand Prix. Nissan management saw there was a future in exporting, but Katayama's direction was at odds with management. They'd previously looked at making a coupe in the mid-60s using a Yamaha engine. Toyota had released their interpretation of a sports coupe in 1966 as the 2000 GT using that same Yamaha engine, but the pricey car had failed. Nissan were concerned they were going to make the same mistake. But what they hadn't made the same mistake on was the price. The new car would be cheaper to manufacture, and Katayama himself wanted it to be a sports car that everyone could afford. The new coupe hit Japanese showrooms in 1969 and American shores in 1970, but the badge on the back wasn't to Katayama's liking. Nissan had named it the Fair Lady Z, the Z coming from the project name of Project Z. Katayama felt the name just wouldn't work in the US. All of the cars were held up from delivery until badges could be replaced with 240Z. And the story goes that Katayama took all of the Fair Lady names off the cars himself. The car was a really good deal, around the same price as the MGB GT that was already five years old. But the 240Z looked more modern. It could beat some Porsche 911s or Jaguar E-types in a drag race, yet cost a lot less. The 1.6 litre from the Datsun 510 was stretched to a 121 horsepower 2.4 litre six cylinder that gave the 240Z its name. That sporty body was made from steel, not fiberglass like some of its more exotic competition. That meant it was heavier, but Nissan used thinner steel to try to shave some weight. Inside the car, Nissan continued the sporty look with deep dials and lots of gauges, but the car felt cheap with black vinyl used throughout. The handling was good, but not in the category of some sports cars, but for pure power and enjoyment it couldn't be beaten at its price point. That price, just $3,500, made it an affordable two-seat Grand Tourer with bags of space for your bags. And unlike the British sports cars, the 240Z was reliable. And American car makers just didn't make a car that competed with this. They were still making pony and muscle cars like the Camaro or the Mustang. Long waiting lists formed of up to six months. Katayama's bet had paid off. The motor critics largely praised this newcomer. Telling words came at the end of a 1970 road and track review. We expect to see the Datsun establish a market of its own, one which will force other makers to come up with entirely new models to gain a share in it. The Japanese industry is no longer borrowing anything from other nations. In fact, a great struggle may be ahead just to prevent a complete reversal of that cliché. Prophetic words indeed. Soon the cars would be exported beyond the United States, with the cars appearing in Europe with that 240Z badge on the back. 
But the UK was more fixated on another type of Z cars, the TV programme, and a certain domestic coupe, the Ford Capri. However, Nissan would find their more pedestrian cars selling in increasing numbers, as Europeans, like Americans, found these cheap cars were a lot more reliable than domestic cars. To make the car more palatable to American buyers, Nissan started offering an automatic gearbox later on in 1970, and air conditioning in 1972. And Katayama would sell the car the only way he knew, by taking it racing. After a shaky start, when they found the engine would literally tear itself apart at sustained high revs, the car won the SCCA C-Class title in both 1970 and 1971. With the car beating Porsche 911s on the racetrack, customers started asking why they pay more for a Porsche. The 1973 oil crisis helped Japanese car companies that in general had more fuel efficient cars. Although it wasn't particularly fuel efficient against European rivals, it was against American muscle cars, and thanks to a favourable exchange rate, Nissan found its inexpensive cars in high demand. By the end of the 240Z run, over 160,000 had been made, with 97% of them being exported to North America. The updated 260Z model was launched for the 1974 model year. As you can imagine from its name, the 2.4 litre engine had grown an extra 200cc by becoming a 2.6 litre by lengthening the engine's stroke. But power output was down, at least in the USA, due to federal emissions regulations. Handling was improved by making a few changes, such as a rear sway bar, but the car was essentially the same old 240Z that had been selling well with little direct competition. Nissan also introduced a 2 plus 2 model, initially for the 240Z and then the 260Z. The car used a chassis that was stretched 12 inches to allow at least a modicum of room in the back for passengers. The regular 260Z was also available as a T-roof that allowed the roof panels to be removed. After just one year of selling the 260Z, Nissan introduced the 2.8 litre 136 horsepower 280Z in 1975. The extra engine size was achieved by boring the engine out, and it gained Bosch fuel injection, but apart from a few changes, the car remained roughly the same as it had before. But with those emissions regulations, the car, at least in the USA, remained about as fast as the 1970 240Z. Katayama was doing great work for Nissan in North America, opening up a critical export market. But he was always out of step with Nissan executives in Japan, and some criticised him for going local. He was summoned back to Nissan headquarters in 1977, where he was forced into retirement. However, he was inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame in 1998 and continued to promote Nissan for the rest of his life, ever the autophile he had been since he was a child. Nissan updated Katayama's coupe as the 280ZX in 1978. It was almost entirely new, with just the engine and drivetrain from the 280Z. Like with the previous car, it was available as a 2 seat or 2 plus 2 version, although the 2 seat version was always more popular. And the T roof option was back for a semi open top experience. The focus was less on a raw sports car and more on a leisurely Grand Tourer. Engine output was broadly similar, but acceleration was a tad slower due to further emissions regulations. The car became much more refined, with softer suspension, better sound insulation, more comfortable seats, cruise control, electric windows and power steering. That black vinyl interior had also got a complete makeover to help it compete with more luxury models. And Nissan needed a better car, with new competition coming such as the Toyota Supra. In Japan, the Fair Lady Z was offered with a 2.8 litre and a 2 litre engine that hit a lower tax bracket. And abroad, for the first time conservative Nissan felt secure enough to put their name on the back of Datsun branded cars. But for now, it was just a sub-brand. So did the more laid back GT 280ZX lose its edge and put customers in North America off? Not a bit of it, the car sold better than ever, and the addition of the 180 horsepower turbo version in 1981 only helped sales. The turbo initially only sold as an automatic, as Nissan were worried the poor 5-speed manual gearbox just couldn't cope with all that power. 
And with the turbo's introduction, Nissan also firmed up the soft suspension that wasn't as good as it could be on mountain roads. Nissan had a true hit on its hands. They also kept racing with famous names like Paul Newman. Those of you who only know Paul Newman from acting may not know he was also pretty good at motor racing, and the 280ZX got him three of his four SCCA national champion wins. Nissan would trade on this success with the limited edition 280ZX-R model, with large rear spoiler similar to the one the race cars had used. The car got a small update in 1982. The outside changes were minor, but under the skin the car got revised steering and rear suspension, and the non-turbo engine got a small bump in power. But by this time the price had also got a bump, which meant the car wasn't the bargain it had been in 1970. Nissan introduced the new model as the 300ZX in 1983. As you'd expect from the name, the car got an uprated 3-litre engine, in this case Japan's first mass-produced V6 engine, producing an uprated 164 horsepower or 225 horsepower when it was turbocharged. European models made 240 horsepower due to a better shaped camshaft profile. The chassis was the same, but turbo models got electronically controlled shocks, and motor critics reported that it had improved handling. The car also got a slippery outside, getting the drag factor down from 0.385 to 0.31. The interior was updated, with climate control and an optional electronic dashboard that also utilised a voice warning system. As you can imagine, this spoke warnings when the driver needed alerts such as an open door, low fuel or the lights being left on. Nissan celebrated their 50th anniversary with a special edition in 1984 with all the bells and whistles. It included a body sonic audio system that used a separate amp and transducers in the seats to make the bass be felt by the occupants. Sort of like a mainstream version of this. The Australian 50th anniversary edition didn't have all these features. In fact, it seems Nissan Australia took something that wasn't much more than a standard car and got the dealers to attach 50th anniversary badges to it. By 1985, the transition from Datsun to Nissan had been completed, and Nissan were right to feel proud of their cars, with them being known around the world for high quality and dependability. The 300ZX got a slight restyle in 1986, and new side mouldings were colour matched as was the trend for cars in the 1980s. Another style change followed in 1987, and it was the first car to use LEDs for a brake light, in this case the middle light. The 1989 model was again all new, with only the block of the engine being carried over from the old car. It was the first car to be wholly designed on computer, in this case a Cray supercomputer. The new shape rounded out those straight edges of the old model to keep up with automotive fashion, and it got extra interior gadgets such as electrically adjustable seats. The engine got a double overhead cam, variable valve timing and twin turbos to boost output to a massive 279 horsepower, giving the car a blistering 0-60 speed of just 5.6 seconds. Pretty good for a car that weighed 1600 kilograms. In Europe only turbo models were sold, but in Australia only the naturally aspirated version was available. But that wasn't the best the 300ZX could do. In 1990, Motorsports International and Japanese tuning company HKS produced the SR71Z32. With uprated turbos, new electronics and a body kit, the car produced a reputed 464 horsepower. Just eight were made, and each cost $65,000. The regular 300ZX also got four-wheel steering, which was the latest feature to appear on Japanese cars. As a side note, the car behind me, the LEGO 8880, is the only one made that has four-wheel steering on it. This feature had appeared on the Mazda 626 and the Honda Prelude just a couple of years before, and had already appeared on the Nissan Skyline. It was cool technology that not only reduced the turning circle, but at high speed allowed for quick direction changes. But most customers weren't willing to pay the extra money for it, and it was discontinued by most car companies after just a few years. The 2 Plus 2 remained popular, and in Europe and Australia it was the only model imported. And by now, the T-roof was sold on most cars, with the hardtop models becoming something of a rarity. 
Nissan went the whole hog in 1982 and took the whole roof off with the convertible 300ZX. They approached two companies to produce designs, Straumann and ASC or the American Sunroof Company. ASC's winning design was manufactured by Nissan back in Japan. Sales of the 300ZX started well but tailed off quickly, and a strong yen didn't help. The car's price in the USA increased 67% over the 1990s, but not all of this could be attributed to the exchange rate. Nissan wasn't as lean as other car companies, which meant it had to charge more for its cars, but this meant the company was starting to lose money. The 300ZX wasn't the bargain price sports car everyone could own any longer, and buyers were looking elsewhere. In the late 90s, the 300ZX was withdrawn from sale outside Japan after a run of 28 years. It soldiered on in Japan for just a couple more years, with very few sales. Japan never bought Z cars in large numbers, with the car being heavily taxed either for a large engine or for its large size. Nissan did try to keep the Z car name alive in the USA with a program of restoring and reselling old 240Zs, but they were losing money on each one, so the program was quickly canned. But in the background, they were working on a new Z car and working with Utaka Katayama to build it. The team wanted to go back to the car's roots, a two-seater you could throw through the bends and have a lot of fun doing it. It would also compete with the Mitsubishi Eclipse that was starting to sell well in the US. A concept was shown at some local US roadshows in 1998 to gauge opinion. However, despite getting Katayama's seal of approval, Yoshihiko Matsuo, the person who'd originally designed the 240, hated it. A revised Nissan Z concept in the brilliant orange was launched at US auto shows in 1999. Like the original, it used a 2.4 litre engine powering the rear wheels, but this was a four cylinder unit from the Nissan Altima. There was pushback on the styling, but also on the engine that was seen as underpowered. Nevertheless, this provided excitement around what a new Z car could look like. Despite Nissan having massive debts in 1999, which led to Renault taking a large stake in the company, Nissan returned two years later in 2001 with an updated design. The new car had a more powerful 3.5 litre V6 engine, also ripped from the Nissan Altima, but tuned for more power. Nissan sold the 350Z in a slightly modified and more upmarket guise as the Infiniti G35 Coupe, Infiniti being Nissan's premium brand. The car was a foot longer and that was needed to allow for the 2 plus 2 layout. The original 240Z had cost a little more than the less powerful European imports and cheaper than the more powerful domestic muscle cars, and it hit a perfect sweet spot. The new car hoped to do the same. At $27,000, the 2002 Nissan 350Z was more than a Mazda Miata, but the 287 horsepower engine wasn't that far off the power of a Porsche 911 at a fraction of the price. And that engine got the car to 60 in the same 5.6 seconds it took the 300ZX. That was Porsche Boxster territory for much less money. Before BMW produced their series of promotional films starring Clive Owen, Nissan produced a promotional film for the 350Z called The Run. Shot in closed down streets in Prague, it's a six minute high octane run that showed off the speed of Nissan's new car. The interior quality wasn't great compared to the competition, another trait it shared with the 240Z from the 70s, but had heated seats and satellite navigation and all the other luxury features customers were looking for. But all that faded into insignificance when you got the car on the road. It handles beautifully. The old 240Z was back. The new car was strictly a two-seater, and there was no T-roof option, but in 2004 the 350Z Roadster appeared with a roof that could be electrically retracted. The same year, Nissan's performance tuning division, Nismo, tuned the car to give it extra power. By 2006, even standard 350Zs had 300 horsepower or more, but despite all these improvements, sales were never as high as in the heyday of the 1970s and 1980s. Although the 2009 370Z looked very similar to the 350Z, many components under the skin had been re-engineered. The wheelbase was 4 inches shorter, and as the name suggests, the engine size was increased to 3.7 litres by lengthening the engine stroke as they'd done with the 260Z. 
The car now accelerated to 60 in 5 seconds, giving it almost supercar-like speed, all for the low, low price of around $29,000. And Nismo tuned special editions also continued. The new innovation for the 370Z was the Synchro Rev Match, which automatically blipped the engine on downshifts to help the engine match the speed of the wheels. And on the interior, better quality materials fixed the cheaper feel of the 350Z. But with a lower roof and shorter car, the already cramped interior of the 350Z wasn't exactly going to be spacious. Nissan launched a 40th anniversary Fairlady Z in Japan in 2009, and the following year a 40th anniversary version limited to 1000 units appeared in North America. Like with the 350Z, a luxury Infiniti G37 2 Plus 2 was also available. The 370Z got a mid-cycle spruce up in 2013, but this was limited to some option changes, a new front fascia, new wheels, and in Japan a new front bumper. 350Z sales had tailed off in the US and Europe, and with the 370Z they didn't pick up. 2020 bought another anniversary edition, this time the 50th anniversary of Nissan selling Z cars in North America. And 50 years for any car series is a rare thing. Rumours started about the next car in the series, that's been dubbed the 400Z. Although with the slow sales of the 370Z, it'll be interesting to see what Nissan can come up with to make this car a hit. Nissan and Utaka Katayama should be really happy with the legacy they've created. 50 years of reasonably priced cars, delivering an unreasonable amount of fun and performance. A special thanks to Nick Gracchini and Simon Parsons for helping me with this video. And a big thank you as always to my patrons. They get early advert free access to new videos, and if you want to join them, click on the link in the description. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.